And thanks for tuning in to another edition of Playbook Against the Spread podcast on the Playbook Experts YouTube channel. I'm host Greg De Palma filling in as best I can for our leader, Mark Lawrence, who's uh, off today dealing with some personal matters. He'll be back again next week. And uh, even the boss needs some time out. So how's it going, guys? How's it going, everybody? Go- going great, Greg. And we're just wondering if you might be the next reincarnation of Wally Pip. Or <laughs> I don't actually so. that, uh, yeah. that, that Mark may be in Wally yeah. Pip and you'll be taking over full time. Yeah. Well, anything to uh, leave <laughs> Our me. younger listeners can Google uh, uh, Wally Pip. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, Richardson tapped out last week, said he was tired, and now he doesn't have a job. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, he'll be well rested if he's called in as an emergency replacement. We know that. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Greg. Somebody on the panel here deserves some big time props from last week. Uh, he said later in the show last week, "You're not even going to need the points with this underdog. Bet him to win outright." That's right. And that was and that was our man, Jim Feist who said not only will the Browns cover against the Ravens, but he called the outright underdog win. Jim, we're not (laughs) worthy. Jim, what a great, great call in a fabulous game with uh, our boy uh, in his very first start, Jameis Winston, outplaying even Lamar Jackson. What a great call. Thank you, Victor. It just shows you that. Every every decade, I get one right. (laughs) Hopefully, you had some nice money line action on that as well. Yeah. It was oh, a good game for me. Well, yeah, that was absolutely. close to four to one, so yep. not yep. bad for an NFL game, that's for sure. Uh, also, speaking of getting things right, uh, Mark uh, is coming off a five-star NFL game of the month winner. He had the Eagles uh, as a three-point dog against Cincinnati, and that was off. That was fresh off of his five-star college football play of the month with Georgia over Texas, also as a dog. Right. right. Certainly, they're. Cincinnati didn't realize the game was 60 minutes. Mark had a great week. It, it, he made some great calls. What What do you guys make of the Cincinnati team? I mean, are they uh, just badly coached? What the hell's going yeah. on there? Poorly coached and disgruntled, and wasting Joe Burrow. Well, yeah, they, their their problem the first few weeks was they couldn't stop anybody. And then the last few weeks, all of a sudden, the defense showed some improvement, and they were fortunate, for example, to beat the Giants, but the offense has not been at that same level. Now, obviously, a lot of it has to do with T. Higgins being out. Certainly, at the start of the season, it didn't hurt it as much, but certainly the last week it did, and we'll see what happens when they get to play one of everybody's whipping boys this week, the Raiders. This is definitely not a league of parity. we got teams that are barely better than college clubs on this, in, in the NFL right now. And I think that's really what it is, is, is coaching. I think that the, uh, there's just not enough good coaching in the NFL anymore. And I know it's an issue with not being able to practice and all that, but that's just, that's never going to change. So you got to get over that. But yeah, the coaching, I mean, I'll, I'll point right, right to my own team. And everybody can say what they want about this, that, or the other thing, but the Jets coaching staff is awful. It's just awful. I mean, Never yeah. should have fired Sully. He wasn't the problem. Well, no, but Salah's problem was uh, not hiring the right offensive coordinator. See, his buddy... He didn't have, he didn't, he didn't have a choice, Aaron Rodgers. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. When he first got hired... When he first got hired, he hired his buddy, his, his, his best man at his wedding's little brother, to be the offensive really? coordinator who had never been offensive coordinator before, and he's, it was terrible. And, and he did it with, with, a, with, a, with a rookie quarterback. So he brings in an office coordinator with no experience with a rookie quarterback, Zach Wilson. And they hired Greg Knapp, who had all that great experience. I mean, Knapp was an excellent quarterback coach, offensive coordinator, tons of experience. What happened? Greg Knapp passed away before he could coach his first game with the Jets. And they never replaced him. And then since then, look what happened with D'Amico Ryans, uh, Salah's buddy. Who did he hire to coach C.J. Stroud? Ben Slowick. How's that working out? Pretty good. No. Yeah, soon, to be a head, soon to be a head coach uh, after this season, I yeah. would think. So, yeah, the coaching is just terrible. And, uh, and, and, and not just the Jets, but, again, all across the league. 
uh, because... Uh, but, you know, part, part of the problem with the Jets has been a long time, the ownership of that team. Ever since Sonny Werblin sold the team to, I think, Leon Hess back in the early 1980s, the Jets have been one of the league's most dysfunctional franchises. I mean, I, I'll go back to days with the New York Giants, who were a premier team in the early 60s, and then they suffered a drought for about 15 years because they kept promoting former players in the organization to large management roles. When they finally went out and hired George Young, who I think had been with Miami, the Giants became a team that won, uh, what, two Super Bowls over the next uh, decade and the decade and the 12 years. And, and I think... You know, it, it's, it's amazing that these... I mean, uh, granted, I mean, we all wish we were well, well off enough to buy a team and have a team as a toy. But some of these guys, their egos are so large, they're larger than their bankrolls. I mean... We keep talking about Jerry Jones, mm -hmm. it, it, but there's other teams just like it with these ego mania. Well, I can't. I'm not gonna, I don't want to say. That. Especially with some of the off-field issues, and now this is one of the best teams in the league. Well, that was that was a big that was a mess for and that's and that's it, Andy. Is that uh, as long as you because every owner eventually might be able to get it right, but it starts with that GM, the guy who runs the team, and you got to find that guy. And just look at Detroit. I remember I was talking to um, uh, my uh, my Lions insider uh, uh, Jeff Risden about three years ago. This was a year before they started to make a move. And we were talking, we were going over the preseason outlook and we're looking at that, that front office and, we're, and, 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 the, and the staff. And, and it was, I was going, you know, I'm pretty impressed with this front office they're putting together here in Detroit. And he was telling me about, you know, the Chris Spielman this and, and, and some of the guys that they brought in. And I was like, you know what, I really, I mean, even either the Dorsey, I believe, was also like one of the guys that's behind the scenes. And it's like, you know, there have a lot of smart guys in this organization. It just looks like they're doing it right. Sure enough, a couple of years later, look at them. They're one of the powerhouse teams in the NFL. So you got to get it right. You got to hire the right people to run your team. And look, I don't care what, as a Jet fan, uh, we all know they're going to hire a new head coach next year. And I'll tell you right now, I would tell you whether Woody Johnson knows what he's doing. If he gets rid of Joe Douglas, he's an idiot. Exactly. Joe Douglas is not the problem. So, you know, anybody that's run a company knows how difficult it is to hire good quality people that are going to have a vision with the people that they, they have to hire. Putting a group together like that is extremely difficult, and actually, it's almost like a, a TV show. Getting the right cast that will blend together—it's very, very difficult to do that, and it, you have to be kind of lucky to make it happen. Yep. And I think you're right, Greg, as far as the patience that Detroit showed. If you recall the year you're talking about, that was the year I believe the Lions started 0 and 0, 10 and 1, ended up 3 13 and 1. And then the following year, they improved to 9-8, and eight, knocked Green Bay out of the playoffs on the final game of the season. That had no implications, really, I believe, for Detroit, but did certainly for, for uh, Green Bay. And then what do they do? They make it to the NFC Championship game last year, and they've continued their strong play this year because they were patient. They didn't make rash, uh, rash decisions, and ownership stood out of the way. Yeah, again, uh, even even making a hire as, as, as simple as bringing in someone like Spielman was important because it brought back a winning culture to the organization the last time they had a winning culture. Uh, and again, you just take a look at and, and then Ben Johnson. I mean, how lucky are they to have, Bre uh, to have Ben Johnson for one more year? Uh, I, I can't imagine he's still going to be there next year. Uh, of course, as a Jet fan, I just hope, hope, hope. But uh, there's a lot of teams out there that are going to be hoping that Ben Johnson becomes uh, their head coach, even though he doesn't have head coaching experience, but at least he comes from an organization that, it, that is doing it right. And so that should help him out. Uh, with making That's why I wonder what the age difference is between Dan Campbell and Ben Johnson, because if, uh, if Johnson is the younger of the two, uh, if I'm Detroit, I might pay him almost as much as a head coach, and he's the coach in waiting or something to keep him. Because we've seen how when offensive coordinators leave from one team to another, they'll often have success at the new job, and the previous team will have difficulty finding someone uh, to replace them at the same level. 
what do you guys then uh, speaking of the Browns there's a lot there's some uh, talk uh, from one side to another you know it, it, regarding whether or not Stefanski's the right guy I personally think he did a great job last year with having the five quarterbacks and getting them to the playoffs and and doing that now I don't know how much and maybe Victor knows and from he's from Cleveland maybe he has some connections or something but how much were his hands tied by Haslam to keep Watson on the field when everyone knew he wasn't capable? Yeah, you're definitely right about that, Jim. Uh, is, is that uh, he is uh, coaching there with uh, a little bit of a handcuff, if you will. Give him a little bit of credit, though, uh, particularly for what he did last week, taking a step back and giving Ken Dorsey the offensive play calling in that game against the Ravens. So Stefanski obviously has doesn't much of, a, of an ego whatsoever because he did not call the offensive plays last week. It was Dorsey who did in that uh, victory uh, for the Browns in which, A, they scored more than 20 points for the first time this season and, and they, uh, had uh, 400 yards they, of offense. And they beat a tremendously talented team. That was not an easy victory. And that had to have a positive uh, ramifications inside the locker room. A, you had your the quarterback who deserved to be playing, for, regardless of the reason that the owner, you know, the others in the injury. And B, the head coach was put his ego aside, like you said, Victor, and allowed offensive play calling to someone whose sole responsibility is running the offense during practice during the week, etc. I think that, that that had to have a positive of impact. I'd like I'd like to see two teams that I think have an opportunity. They're struggling now. I'd like to see some odds. Cincinnati, Cleveland, and the LA Rams. Which one of those three teams has the best chance of making the playoffs? Keep in mind the Rams have the best chance of making the I agree. I Lost to the Giants. I think they had one other loss earlier in the year, and they beat, I think, Miami uh, the week after two got two got injured. So maybe the odds makers also have the same uh, thoughts that uh, the Rams are clearly better than their records. And based on what they did last year, they had. Well, secondly, based upon what they did last year, they know they can make a run. And third, they are in a division right now. I believe if they beat Seattle, they'll be four and four, tied with the 49ers who have a bye, and then pick up ground possibly on Arizona as well. We have to. Qu- we also have to talk about Arizona a little bit. How good are they? Can they actually put, get on? I mean, nobody really knows about them. Nobody ha- talks about them. But the, be, winning down in Miami was not easy. Although two of his first came back, but that was not an easy victory. Nobody, everybody in the world picked Miami in that game. The line went all the way up, almost six before kickoff. Yeah, Miami was a very sharp handicap for play last week, absolutely, with that big line move that you just talked about. Uh, They still don't know how to finish teams off, the Dolphins. They had a nine-point lead in the fourth quarter against the Cardinals. You're supposed to finish teams off when you're up by two scores. If you want a reason to play Miami here's to win against Buffalo, take it for what it's worth. Teams after playing Arizona are 7-0 straight up, 6-1 against the points this year. No, really? Yeah. Wow. I was stunned when I saw not, that. Not but I'll, 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 I'll still take the Bills. Uh, I may take Bills, Miami plus the points. By the way, the uh, line actually, Vegas actually opened the line, uh, Seattle won. And then uh, I guess. I think was that was a, the advanced line, though, wasn't that? No. The Tuesday I, line? No, it was, uh, was that? it was on whatever, Monday or Monday night, I think. Okay. So, um, and it quickly in 24 hours went to, what is it, two now? L.A.? Something like that? One and a half or two. I, I saw yeah. one and a half this morning. But 
Uh, by the way, I want to remind everybody that we are still inching closer to reaching 1,000 subscribers. We want to get there before the end of the season, so please help us out with that. If you haven't subscribed before, hit that subscribe button and also uh, like, share, uh, let us know what you think, what's on your mind, questions, comments, all that kind of stuff that's really something that we uh, like to engage with, including uh, our last segment on this show later on uh, where we take a look at our uh, latest comments and questions from over the past week, including from the Coffee Club emails, which we'll get into later on as well. Uh, we want to remind everybody, too, that uh, you can check out the latest issue of Playbook Football Newsletter. It's available now at playbooksports.com. And in this week's edition, uh, I believe, Victor, is that 18 pages? 18 pages, chock full. There you go. Uh, And there's a team uh, that is 1-12 straight up and against the spread on the road in college football in Game 9 conference games of the season. And I don't think, uh, I, I, you know, I, and I'll just give a hint. This is, a, it's a good team. It's a good team this season. That's not a, that's not a great hint, but it's a good team that maybe they're not used a to A very good there. team. Yeah. That's the best I can do. Yeah, I, I read that. Pretty remarkable. Yeah, so. I thought that applied to uh, uh, to the NFL, and I was going to say uh, the Aaron Boone of the. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a little bit of the World Series when Kenny White uh, comes on. Handicapper has his own channel, Bet the Gambit. Uh, Kenny's going to make an appearance a little bit later on, and uh, when he does, we'll, uh, we'll we'll talk to him for a few minutes about the World Series, and also uh, that is when we'll go around the horn uh, and find out what everybody's. Uh, plays or 60 second plays are on a high five picks, uh, but that's later hey, on. Hey Yankees, you missed. Hey, Yankees, you missed. That, that, that was Speaking about I managers, I said about halfway through. Yeah, I said about. I said about halfway through that the game should have been switched from Fox to the Comedy <laughs> Channel. <laughs> comedy. I uh, want to remind everybody too, Mark's, uh, we told you about his five, uh, his five star NFL game of the month. Well, Mark is also writing a five and one run in his last six best bets. He's covered five straight upset games of the week. So Mark doing the dogs. Uh, and uh, that's uh, always great when you can do that because that means at least half of those are probably outright upset wins. Okay. So, speaking of potential outright upset wins, you get more of those in college than you get in the NFL. And that's where we're going to start off with, college football, of course. And before we get into our game of the week, and it's a big one in the Big Ten between Ohio State and Penn State. Before we get into that, uh, let's, go around, uh, uh, let's go around the horn, so to speak, starting with Tony. I'm going to ask you, Tony, give us a – we're at that point now. It's starting to get – Interesting. Playoffs are on the horizon. So give us a sleeper pick in college football. Some some team that you think can crash the party in the national semifinals that you actually also think might have a shot at winning the national championship. It's got to be a sleeper team, though. Right. I mean, if we're, going, we're talking sleepers, we're so far out still. I'm going to ride Boise State. I'm going to ride wow. State, which is the ultimate sleeper. That's a good one. I don't think they can win at all of it. Because it, it would require back-to-back -back upsets of huge opponents, including the first, including the fifth-ranked team to, in, in round right. one. And yeah. You're, so, you're, you, but you're talking about a team that legitimately has an NFL running back out there yeah. playing, you know, do man against boy stuff. Uh, so if they get blocking, they statistically, I believe, they lead the nation in sacks, something like that. Yes, so, by a large so, uh, amount. Yeah. So and, and look, definitely strength of schedule does play into that some, but they they, they have played toe to toe with Oregon. And Oregon then uh, in September wasn't what Oregon looks like now. But at the same time, I mean that that does speak volumes about what you can do if you if your bat stays healthy. So we'll see where they're at once. So the way, and remember, Boise game. State is also a better team now. Right, I mean, I, 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 I
nine nine are in the box and, and, and things like that. But yeah, certainly I think you, you, you're talking about the top SEC teams being your favorites. Um, certainly Oregon and Ohio State. I can see them getting to a championship game and then maybe running out of gas against whoever gets that there against them. Well, uh, yeah, because at that point, if they were to get to the semis, not only would they have to beat the fifth-ranked team, but then they'd have to beat the first-ranked team, and that would be asking an awful lot. So if they were able to accomplish that, uh, then I guess anything's possible. So, um, but yeah, that's a good one. All right. Victor, you got one? Yeah, guys. Well, can I? I don't know if I can call an uh, an eight and O team a sleeper, but they're not ranked in the top twelve. So yes. uh, what about what about the Hoosiers? The Indiana. Hoosiers. What about them? Eight and O, uh, number three scoring offense in the entire college football. Forty two points per game, aside from one game. And yeah, they're going to be on the road against Ohio State a little later on down in the season. It's still a realistic path, if you ask me. They're favored by a touchdown on the road against Michigan State this week. They play Purdue. They'll be a home favorite against Michigan next week, I project. And then, of course, uh, a game on the road against the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, And that's the type of team that's given the Buckeyes difficulties in the last two years, the team that can outscore the Buckeyes. So uh, for me, it's a team like the Indiana Hoosiers uh, having this tremendous season already over their win total, 8-0 with a 40-point offense. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to find out because, unfortunately, because of where they're ranked, they, they're going to have to run the table uh, yes. and get to that Big Ten championship game. And then maybe if they do that and even lose the Big Ten championship game, they, they probably should get in. But, yeah, they're going to have to win that Ohio State game. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a shame because if they, if they beat every team and only lose to Ohio State and it's by three points and they don't get into the Big Ten championship game – That'd be kind of hard to leave them out of the playoffs with one loss. Uh, but that's the era we're in today. And I guess, as we said last year, and people are going to be talking about this. Well, what about that 13th team? They're not going to be happy either. But, <laughs> I mean, come on. What are you going to do, right? I mean, they're lucky they're even at this point. In the years past, they've never even been able to be in the discussion. So, all right, Andy? And quite likely, that 13th team will have had two losses anyway. Uh, I've got a couple of thoughts here, and then I'll get to a, a clump. I, I certainly can make a case, and again, you, right now you've got, what, eight or nine uh, unbeaten teams, including a couple of the, you know, the, uh, the group of five level. But it is possible we could see a rematch between Texas A&M and Notre Dame, both of whom currently have one loss but have played extremely well. Notre Dame's one loss, of course, is a little bit harder to explain to Northern Illinois. Texas A&M's loss was to Notre Dame. That's a little bit easier. But the team I'm going to go with is a team that looks horrible to start the season. And they haven't lost since. And that's why they've been under the radar. And that's Clemson. They lost 34-3 to to Georgia, the opening game of the season. And then they have just been bullying every other opponent uh, to that point. I don't think they've uh, won a game by less than, what, 17 points. And I think that was against Virginia. They've scored over 40 points. each other this week one of them will lose so it could very well be especially if Pitt wins knocking down SMU and then Clemson beats Pitt uh, the only other team is still Miami uh, so uh, they would and they don't play they would meet in the ACC championship game I think if Clemson gets in they're very dangerous they've had three down years in a row they had gone what six years I think without having fewer than two losses they've lost three three and four the last three years I think Sweeney is a little bit re-energized had some controversial comments at the start of the season before the season began I think Clemson's a good choice to, uh, uh, to perhaps even take a, a championship futures on or a playoff futures on. Yeah, they got to be. Uh, what, what are they right now? They have to be over 20, right? Probably 30 to 1 in that range. Uh, I don't know. Only because of the fact that they win the ACC, they'll be one of the top four, uh, top four seeds. Well, but it does. I mean, what, what? But what they are now is what is the discussion is is now yeah. today, and so I would think they're probably. I can't. Access I'll, I'll it. see if I can find. Well, uh, we we hear our next view. But that's a good one uh, because they definitely would be considered a sleeper right now, even though they have a brand name. 
uh, that would be a good one. And another one uh, that I'll throw in there uh, because I had them high uh, as, as a nice kind of sleeper pick to win the uh, Big 12 is Iowa State. Uh, because Iowa State is still Iowa State's like kind of in that Indiana BYU kind of uh, category. Mentioned instead of Indiana. Iowa State is even further below the radar in a lot of the media than is uh, Indiana because of the Signetti uh, takeover this year and uh, how remarkable it's been. All right, but I agree. Iowa State, yeah. Let's go ahead now and break down our college football game of the week, Ohio State and Penn. By the way, Clemson 16 to 1. Oh, it's down to 16 to 1 now. Okay, so I guess you've missed your boat. It's not a bad number, but it was definitely a lot better a couple of weeks ago, that's for sure. And uh, they're playing Louisville this week. You, uh, and, and like you said, uh, Andy, the, uh, the, the, their, their games have all been kind of blowouts. Uh, that's the real good thing. Matter of fact, they've owned Louisville. They've beaten them eight straight. They've covered six straight. Uh, yep. Even and, and Louisville, Everton. they just have played tough teams. So. And that's all since uh, since uh, Louisville entered the ACC, I think, in 2014. And I think Sweeney's been coaching at least that long. Uh, so at least he's been for most of those. I don't think they've met. The, yeah, they only met uh, eight out of out of the ten years. But yeah, eight and zero straight up, six and two ATS. Okay. Ohio State, Penn State, and the Buckeyes. This is uh, this is a back against the wall. This is sort of like the Georgia Texas game, uh, where uh, Texas was undefeated and Georgia had one loss, and Georgia just could not afford to lose, and so they were desperate and they evened things out. And now it's an even kind of deal in the, in the SEC with this team beating that team and that beat so. Is that what we're going to see here? Of course, that leaves Oregon and Indiana still undefeated potentially. But uh, Penn State, you know, just watching that game last week, it just seems to me that there might be just that it factor going on with the program this season, that it, this is their year. Um, for that to happen, though, I think they might have to win this football game because unless Indiana comes back and beats Ohio State and then loses – I don't know if Penn State's going to get into the Big Ten championship game, and then I don't know. Sure, I'm not sure they're going to be able to get into the playoffs if they lose this game to Ohio State. So I think this game is just as important to Penn State as it is to Ohio State. The Buckeyes have won against seven straight against Penn State, but Penn State's covered six of the last eight, even though the lines have usually been a little bit bigger than this. I believe it's up to three and a half, four, <clears throat> and uh, down to, down to three and a half or four. It opened four. Okay, down to three and a half or three. Yeah. And this is not actually a good spot for Iowa State overall. Seven and eighteen against the spread. The last twenty-five is a road favorite, and again two and six against Penn State in the last eight. So that's why I like Penn State in this one because I think they have a real good shot to win the game. And if they don't, I could see this being a very close game. I think every point's going to matter. Uh, and I, I'm not overly. And I know Nebraska game was that sandwich game. It came after the Oregon game, and Penn State's the next game. And Nebraska had come off the embarrassing blowout loss in Indiana, and you can expect Ohio State wasn't up for the game. But still, I mean, with, as you're a one-loss team, you, you can't be down late in the second half to Nebraska. So I'm just not overly impressed yet with Ohio State uh, that I think they're vulnerable. And I think Penn State could get them this week uh, with or without uh, Drew Aller. So, uh, but I think Aller's going to play. Uh, what about you? Uh, what about you, uh, Tony? Tony on mute? Yeah. Mute, Tony? There we go. Sorry about that. I, I had myself muted because I was doing other and stuff. But, yeah, I, I was saying that I'm on the fence because of Aller, simply because you have a consummate backup quarterback situation here with uh, Prabula not being tested, especially against – uh, a, a team like this, he was in another offense last year. This is obviously a new offense under Colet Nicky, and he, he he can run this because you know from what we've seen, short passes. He seems to have the system down, um, but Aller obviously gives you the big play threat. Uh, this could shift here, so maybe that'll help against the Ohio State front. Uh, certainly, I'm with you, Greg, in, in terms of I don't dismiss Penn State's chances simply because they can't win. 
But I mean, look, if, if Aller's not 100%, if he's closer to 50 than 100, I play this, this backup. I hope not to get blown out. I hope to run the table. I hope for carnage down the stretch. And I expect to be a top 12 team if I'm Penn State because then you can make the case, well, yeah, we were without our starting quarterback. Uh, if you're Ohio State, this is a must win because uh, then you do become a two-loss team, even if it, this game is tighter, uh, just as tight as the Oregon game. You're still be at the mercy of what happens around you. Uh, I, I, as you know, Greg, haven't seen my votes every week. I am not as high on Ohio State as most everybody in the country. Uh, I just didn't have them in my top three, I don't think. Uh, I, I had them ranked on, b- below Oregon heading into that game in Eugene. Uh, but, they, I mean, don't get me wrong. They're, they're a great team, specifically on the college football level. Available to play. But, uh, again, I think for, from the standpoint of who needs the game more, I think it's the Buckeyes. And I think if Penn State can hang around, um, it'll be a tight game. And uh, both and Ohio State wins. I think that's a win-win for both. Well, guys, I'm on the fence, too, when it comes to the total. And it's based on the Drew Aller information that you mentioned. Will he play? Will he not play? Uh, For that reason, uh, for me, uh, it may be five minutes before kickoff before I actually uh, submit a play in this particular game. If I do, it's going to be the under in in some variety, whether it's uh, first half under, maybe it's full game under. But let's talk about injuries for a minute here. Two weeks ago, the Buckeyes lost – Starting left tackle, Josh Simmons for the season to a knee injury. Last week, their new starting left tackle, uh, Mikulowski, struggled, exited with his own lower body injury. They had to move uh, left guard, Donovan Jackson, out to left tackle. That did not help matters. Whatever the alignment is here, it's going to be a wearying one for Ohio State. You saw how they struggled on offense on the ground with those changes in last week's game against Nebraska. They ran for just 74 yards on 29 carries against a Nebraska stout defensive line like Penn State indeed has there. And the, the, the Lions are far better at defending the pass than Nebraska is. So if the Buckeyes cannot run the ball in this game, I think their passing game suffers as well. Again, on the other side of the ball, it's going to come down to Drew Aller. Even if he does play, he's not going to be 100%. He's not going to be completely, entirely mobile. So you're going to take away one aspect of his versatility. Um, I wouldn't call him a dual-threat quarterback necessarily, but Ohio State does have the number one s and ranked defense, and knowing that he would be limited, it would make that job a lot easier for that defense. Both head coaches, they're far from aggressive when it comes to big games. Both teams have better defenses and offenses right now in the season. And both offenses, like I just said, are a little bit hamstrung. So I'm going to expect a fairly conservative afternoon uh, that will still yield plenty of drama, just not the drama driven by explosive offensive fireworks. So it's either going to be over in the uh, under in the first half under in the full game. Either way, we're going to wait till probably about five minutes before kickoff when we find out if Drew Aller is going to go or not. And one quick thing to add, Penn State's run defense has been really good. And I was disappointed in Wisconsin because my big play uh, was Badgers, Nitty Lions over the post to total, simply because the Wisconsin's offense now has air raid concepts. I think a lot of even odds makers kind of that flies over their heads. Uh, and so the Wisconsin offense has some teeth, and they certainly were able to move the ball. But Penn State, except for USC, has consistently shut down everybody's run game. So if they can get a handle on Ohio State, turn Will Howard into a passer, I, I think that plays into your under two bit. Tony, you may have been one week too early with the Wisconsin overs because I do like their over this week against Iowa, a team that's now 7-1 to the over on the season. <laughs> wow. They're one of those teams with a pro running back, too. I mean, that Wisconsin <laughs> is another level. All right, yes. before I uh, ask Andy, Jim, 
I want to ask you, I know you're not following college football too much, but you certainly have followed a lot of big games in the past with James Franklin as the head coach. Uh, and he hasn't come through very often. Uh, this is, this, look, I, I just mentioned, he's 0-4 uh, against Ohio State. Ryan Day's got his number. Um, how does that go into your handicapping when you, we just talked about it, coaching. So do, do, you, do you look at a game like this and go, I'm not touching James Franklin in a big spot. He, he, he just never comes through. Or do you say, you know what, I'm going to stay away from a game like this uh, because maybe you're right. Maybe this is their year. Maybe this is just a different year. And uh, this is maybe just a, a type of Penn State team. Sort of like Jim Harbaugh. He struggled against the spread for a long time until he finally had his team. Well, I have, I have some concepts that I follow when I'm analyzing sports whether it's college basketball, pro, pro football, uh, baseball, anything that I'm presently doing, what, I, what, what I'm basically saying is a couple sports that I originate my own, my own activity and then other sports that I follow betters and that are actually winning a lot of money at a particular sport. And fortunately, being here for six decades, I know quite a few people there aren't quite a few people actually win a lot of money betting, but there are some that I do know. So I follow their bets and their, their activities. Um, their, their previous record in games like this and coaches' previous records do matter because constant failure or constant success at something does mean something. So I have already bet Penn State this week because one of the people – that has been doing remarkably well with substantial money uh, has bet Penn State this week. And so I, I did already bet that. Okay. Now, the reason he likes it, he did not tell me. He doesn't okay. tell me. He just tells me who he bets. And that's enough for me. Yeah, it's too bad. And we all hope Drew's going to play in the game. Uh, I don't know. He kind of reminds me of like a Ben Roethlisberger type uh, that he's, he's a tough kid. He's going to find a way to, to, to make plays uh, out of the pocket when he needs to. He's tough, but he's also going to be banged up a lot because he's tough. But he's got a strong arm, he's a, he's, and he's just, he's just a pup. So I think he's going to be a very successful NFL quarterback whenever he comes out. Uh, he's just got to figure out a way to not be so tough uh, sometimes. I know it's, not as, it's, it's easier said than done, but uh, you got to stay healthy. Andy, well, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about some pro football in a little while. I know, and the big change in Indianapolis where they switch from Richardson to Flacco, and and that type of situation that you just talked about, you alluded to, is very present with the player they benched, Richardson. So, and we'll get into that later. But there's a few thoughts I have about. Okay, that. Andy. Yes, Greg, I'm going to put in a little plug here for uh, Mark Lawrence's preview magazine because there's still a lot of football to be played, and it allows you to do some research like I was doing while, the, uh, uh, while, while Jim, Tony, and Victor to confirm what I thought was the case. James Franklin's been at Penn State for a long time. Ryan Day has been at Ohio State five years. Ryan Day, as coach of the Buckeyes, is 5-0 and straight up against Penn State. So you got the same coaches. The players changed gradually in certain senses from year, but you got the same coach. So maybe there's something what Ryan um, Day has been able to pick apart. Now, you mentioned that Penn State is like six and two or something in the last eight years, or some strong point spread record. The four years prior to last year, when Ohio State played Penn State, Ohio State was a double-digit favorite against Penn State, yep. and the games were more competitive. Last year was the first time it was a competitively priced game. Ohio State was a four-point favorite. They won by eight. I think it was 20 to 12. So basically what we're saying is I'm not going to put too much into the fact that Penn State has a great point spread record because certainly under the current coaching matchup of the two coaches, Ohio State's been clearly the better program and been required to lay a, a bigger number, but Penn State's been a quality program for so long they still get some top caliber athletes. As far as this game is concerned, I wanted to make a case for Penn State in this game, but when I took a look back and confirmed what I thought, I am concerned about Aller, the quarterback, and how, how Penn State would be without him. At the same time, I was very impressed with what Penn State did to Wisconsin last week. I was on uh, Wisconsin last week. They led at halftime, and then Penn State took over the game. Now, 
Ohio State has already been on the wrong end of a very close game this year when they uh, lost at Oregon 32-31. A couple of mistakes maybe Ohio State didn't make. They would win that game. Penn State, on the other hand, has been able to win a close game when they came from behind to tie, force overtime, and then beat SC. So Penn State has been able to play a competitive game and come out on the right side. Ohio State uh, is falling short, although if there was another possession after uh, uh, the field goal, maybe uh, Ohio State goes down and gets a field goal of their own. So I'm probably going to pass this game. I respect the history, but... Uh, and, and Jim can relate to this as well. When you have two really strong pedigreed programs and you're getting points at home with a team that is capable about, of beating almost any team in the country, I will generally look to take the points. And if I'm getting three and a half at Penn State, that would qualify. Despite the fact of the poor history between the coaches, this is a different team. But Aller has to be in that game for me to feel comfortable. History is history, and it does play a, fact, a part in all of our – handicapping we're looking at it and and there's several people that put a lot of emphasis on history and there's other people that put a lot of emphasis on current form and matchups so when you mix that all together you come up with your formula for winning but penn state i'm from pennsylvania but i never went to penn state so i'm not i have no no affiliation but uh, I, I like their i like their situation in this game yeah before we start talking NFL, uh, Vic is going to be taking off early. Vic, uh, before uh, I know we're, we're not going to do our uh, our sixty second video clips. Uh, your uh, your your time to take a look at maybe a game or trend of the week. Did you want to do that early, or are you going to pass on that for next week? Sure, I can do that. Let me whip something out here real quick, and I will sit in for the NFL segment. I do want to. Oh, you will talk about. Yeah, I, I will sit in for the NFL segment, the Detroit uh, game. Okay. Um, but l let me just throw this in here real quick. 60-second uh, countdown. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to look at the uh, Sunday night game. And um, while I like the game over itself, Minnesota is playing the Colts. It's a time change game. Don't forget, uh, flexed to uh, the night game for NBC uh, TV. Uh I like Minnesota over their team total a little bit better. The Vikings over 25 and a half points in that non-conference game against the Colts. You got a, a Minnesota team that's uh, on tilt a little bit. They're steaming a little bit after that Thursday night loss to the NFL uh, LA Rams last Thursday night. Uh, home favorites of four or more in the NFL off a Thursday road loss have averaged 31.1 points per game in the last 10 years. That applies to the Vikings. They do have the number seven scoring offense. They're averaging 27 points per game on the season. Even better at home, 28.6. So in the friendly confines of their dome environment, it's just about 29 points per game for the Vikings to seal the deal. They've averaged 30.4 points per game at home versus all AFC opponents in the last three years. The Colts have a bottom five defense. They're allowing 380 yards per game this season. They've allowed 31.6 points per game as non-conference dogs in the last five seasons. So between the two, this is the one I feel a little bit stronger about, the Vikings over their team total of 25 and a half. All right. Uh, Victor doing a uh, double short. Uh, see what happens when you're not in that little, that, that you're not in that form where you're one after another and you're kind of out of sequence. Uh, right. It doesn't work as I'm, I, that. That would be way too much for me to edit, but that's okay, Vic. Uh, the bottom <laughs> line is, is that's still going to be available. We'll make that available to everybody for your uh, pick on that game, and that's actually a game that until we bring in Kenny, we might as well talk about because uh, Jim, you referenced the move away from Richardson uh, to uh, to Flacco. I'm sure there's a lot of Colts fans out there. <laughs> That are, I would guess they're pretty happy about this because we, it's all about the playoffs for us fans. We want the playoffs. Yeah, we want the quarterback, and he, hopefully he's our quarterback of the future, and we want him to be groomed and all that stuff, but he's a pup. He can wait his turn. Let's get to the playoffs. Let him learn behind Joe Flacco on the bench, especially if you take a look at his stats the last couple of weeks, just abysmal. So, uh, And that odds, uh, those, that number dropped as well it should. So uh, what do you think about the game, Jim? Well, 
people people that watched Richardson in college didn't feel that he was ready to come out of of the of the college ranks and come to the pros. That's not my opinion. That was their opinion, and they mentioned that to me in some private conversations that I've had. Watching him in the pros, I'm very unimpressed with him. Uh, he 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 ranks near the bottom in almost every performance metric when it comes to throwing the ball. And this is the NFL. I mean, these are the greatest players in the world at this sport. And then when he runs the ball, he looks for contact. Now, he got away with that in high school and college when he was the bigger, stronger guy. That doesn't work in the pros. I mean, these guys are big. and They hurt. And, they, and, and he's always going to get hurt. And here's, here's another thing. A lot of people don't talk about the reality of of the fact that football players, basketball players, baseball players, these are really, they're people. They're not just players, athletes. You know, they have wives and kids and they have schools and, and they, you know, they don't, don't always want to lose their jobs and be moved on. And it, it's kind of a chaotic lifestyle to be traded from one team to another all the time. They know they have a good team in that clubhouse and they know that this kid isn't the one that's going to win for them. Now, there's a faction, I'm sure, in that clubhouse that feel we, he should be the player. But most of the players, and I know this from people that are close to it, they don't. Just like they didn't feel that way about Watson and Cleveland. And they're happy for the change because they want to get to the playoffs. If there's any bonus money to be made by getting to the playoffs or performance bonus money. They want to get that. They do have lives. And this is the right move for now. The future would be nice if this young man, who is a tremendous, and I'm not knocking him. I don't know him. He's a tremendous athlete. This guy can do everything but throw a short pass. <laughs> and but, but you need to do that in this league. They're happy that they're going to get a chance to win. And Flacco, for some unknown reason, this guy can actually he can still win at 40 years old. He did it in Cleveland. He's done it here with the Colts. They are a much better team with him at quarterback. And you can see it, and we'll see it even more in the line as the week goes on. Flacco's going to get money. He's going to get money in this game because Minnesota started the season off hot. Now they're starting to slide. There's a regression for him here. If Flacco was the quarterback the entire game last week, they'd have beaten Houston. Houston's hurting. They have some people out. Diggs got out, he's out for the year. The other receiver is hurt. Their defense isn't playing as well as they did a previous year. So this is the right move for the players in the clubhouse. And they're more important to me than the fans in the stand. Yeah, that that is something that uh, comes up an awful lot when you talk about things of that nature in any sport, like you said, Jim. And, and that is, uh, you, you get frustrated a lot when a coach favors a particular player for whatever reason, um, and it winds up, hurting the rest of the team because of the decision he's making. And, and like you said, there's, how do you know that player is going to be around? He's not going to be around for the next two or three years. What does he care? Uh, you know, he doesn't want to lose just for the sake of grooming a quarterback or any of those players, especially now more than ever. The other thing is, is does anybody have a, a reason that you can point to specifically of why all of a sudden Joe Flacco is playing as good as he's playing? <laughs> he's he's drinking something I want to I want whatever he's drinking. That's all I can say. I, it could just be a health thing and a take a step back thing. Because he did. He went away and then he's been putting the situation now for two different teams and you see the same results. He's I mean, aged well. He's he's not moving any faster. Take care of himself. Don, yeah. Tony, there was a great line last year when he came back for Cleveland. He said, I'm sitting on the couch. I even bought the NFL package. And now I have to go play. <laughs> that was a great line. He's a very, no, very, very intelligent quarterback. And he's exactly. gone through so many offensive coordinators in his career that he knows every offense right now. Uh, 
22.8 points per game. That's the Colts' points per game in the Anthony Richardson starts this year. 27.0 points per game. That's the Colts' points per game in the three Joe Flacco starts. is playing better and gives them a better chance to win. There is there is a, a commonality in there. I mean, maybe on that, just because the, the Jaguars game was so bad and that was all Flacco. Uh, but, I mean, look, I like Shane Steichen a, a ton as a coach, as an in-game coach. They All four losses are one-possession games this season. Definitely, I'm in agreement, Joe Flacco should be the, the, the quarterback ahead of Anthony Richardson. But why didn't you make this move? To, uh, when he originally came back, Richardson, uh, uh, for the Miami game, which he almost cost them. I mean, they were very fortunate yep. to win that game. They won 16 yep. in, in spite of Richardson. They lost last week to a division rival. Now you're two games behind, three if you're thinking tiebreaker. So, All eight all, games by the Colts this year have been decided by six points or less. And, and, and look, again, I'm not a Richardson apologist at all. I watch the guy play. He is and has been. He was anointed Florida's – future high school, I mean, future starting quarterback while in high school down the street in Gainesville. Everybody knew he was going to be the guy. He came out early. Everybody knew that was a weird decision. And yet he was he was made to be he right because he was picked where he was picked. And then he was basically handed the team over. And he was handed the team coming off an injury. So the, the talent is there. You've made the decision, essentially, uh, we're going to Go with the growing pains because this guy is going to be Lamar Jackson once he gets it. And now, by the way, now you're pulling the plug on it though, which is which last is, year is strange. The Colts, the, without Richardson missing a good part of the season, or with Richardson missing a good part of the season, the Colts were nine and eight. Right, and that's all yeah. Steichen, and that's all how. Yeah. He, don't, don't don't forget this is also a team that's dealt with the Jonathan Taylor situation for now multiple right. years. This year only because of injuries. Last year because of the contract holdout. The point is. It's like this is I'm, I'm in agreement with Greg. I'm in agreement with Jim. I, you've got to cater to the entire football team. My point is, I think we're we're giving Steichen a pass for the wishy washiness. Again, great in-game coach. Do not love the decisions to make Richardson the guy at a training camp and then immediately upon his return for that Miami game. The question the question with these coaches being blamed for these decisions, we don't know enough. I probably will never know. I think we, we pretty well know in 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 Cleveland that Haslam, who made that the dumbest trade in the world to get Watson and paying guaranteed money, had something to do with Watson staying on the field and not playing someone right. else. He I don't know about the issue in, in, in Indianapolis with the Colts. Uh, we do know that when they had a pretty good quarterback. It was a kid's name out of Stanford that they destroyed when, without protecting him. Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck. I mean, man, it, but he gets sacked seventy times in one year. I mean, it was like crazy. I mean, so he leaves the game. So I don't know if the ownership there is interfering as well. I have no idea about that. Well, I, I mean, Watson. it's been Chris Ballard's show for a while, and obviously Jim Irsay pulls the strings and. It's, it seems like he's hands off, but maybe he's not. Maybe you're right. The, the Watson decision may have been the second worst trade, <laughs> second only to Babe Ruth and the Yankees and Red Sox in history. <laughs> and imagine, because imagine when you figure for infl inflation, Babe Ruth might have topped that contract in uh, today's dollars. But getting back to the coaches, you know, coaches who are stubborn are almost destined to fail. And the best example I can go with, and I use, I've used it for like 20 years now, is if you go back and you take a look at Brian Billick, got the job with the Baltimore Colts because of his great performance as offensive coordinator with the Vikings. In fact, I think the Vikings set at the time the record for most points scored in the season. So Billick comes over to Baltimore, inherits a great defense, okay, a decent offense. I think, what was it? Was that the year I think Trent Dilfer was there for the uh, Ravens or something yeah. like that? And, ba and Billick basically said, I'm going to let the defense win games for me. And I think it was with three or four years later they won the Super Bowl. Because he was not stubborn enough to say we're going to win with the offense. We're going to have a. We're okay with the offense, but we know the defense is our strength, and that's our bread and butter. Well, th what happened though to him is that he then, for whatever reason, 
wrote his own pink slip when he got stubborn again with the Kyle Bowler situation. He thought he, he thought Bowler was he drafted him to be his man, and that's gonna be my stud quarterback, and I'm gonna go this Kyle Bowler way, and it never worked. And you know what they call you know, that's why the term comes up uh, uh, coach killer from quarterbacks who can get coaches fired. Um, but it is a lot easier uh, when you've got a world championship. And it is funny how that happens, Andy. And that's not the first time yep. it's happened where you see a coach, he gets hired for one specific reason, but it's the exact opposite side of the ball that actually does all the winning. So I know we could probably come up with two or three other examples, but that's probably one of the best ones. All right. We've got the NFL game of the week to talk about here in a few minutes. Don't forget to order your copy now of the 2024 Playbook Totals Tip Sheet Newsletter. That's uh, 14 out of 17 years winning. 14 out of 17. So you can subscribe to the Totals Tip Sheet or any other Playbook Newsletter subscription. Get a free Coffee Club e-letter daily through the Super Bowl free no charge bonus. So uh, anything you want to add to that Totals Tip Sheet for this week, Victor? No, I don't, except it was a high-scoring week last week. No, I don't, except Over the total, we talk about all the numbers in this week's issue. And uh, with that said, guys, I got to bow out of here. Got to head over to the doctor. As far as the Packers Lions game goes, I'm laying off the total. I know you're going to be talking about that game in just a few minutes. It's similar to the Penn State the, uh, college football game. You don't know who's going to be quarterback in Green Bay, and you may not know up until 10 minutes before game time. Yeah, I know Jordan Love practiced today on Thursday, but uh, again, we got a long way to go before we get to Sunday. The line is 47 and a half. It could be one of the more weather impacted games of the entire weekend. It does look like rainy Green Bay. It looks like potential high winds. I'm going to pass on the total. There's other games I like a lot more. But with that said, guys, you're going to have to let me bow out of here. Good to see you, Vic. All right. Sounds good, good Vic. Luck, Take care, Vic. Good luck this week. Best of luck this weekend to everybody, guys. Thanks again. I'm still trying to lower my and blood pressure for what Andy told me, that there's 113 games on Monday in college hoops. i got to get the blood pressure down. And that's Thank just and that's just men's. <laughs> that's probably what I'm Kenny's sorry, working on right now. As uh, Kenny, Kenny White. I saw him this morning. Kenny, Kenny woke Yeah, me Kenny up White makes his appearance. Fill in, good timing. So, I uh, Andy. Yeah, Kenny, can you hear us? Oh, Kenny's probably trying to figure out how to hear us. All right, so, yeah, in the meantime, uh, let's talk about that question uh, because uh, not the game, but there's another question that we wanted to uh, go around, a little roundtable discussion here. Uh, We all know that the Chiefs, and this is sort of like what we started off talking about, how there's just not enough good coaching. What's the problem? The NFL teams, it looks like it's another year, the same old, same old. Nobody can coach their team to be capable of beating the Chiefs, and the Chiefs just keep doing their thing, and nobody can knock them off. But let's just say the Chiefs don't win the Super Bowl, uh, which is still going to be tough for them to do. we got a whole half a season to go. So let's just say they don't win the Super Bowl. Uh, Give us a team, if you had to, Start with you, Andy. If you had to pick a team to dethrone the Chiefs right now, which team would you go with? Well, it's easy right now to say well, the, uh, the Detroit Lions. The uh, Detroit they Lions, because they are the current flavor of the week playing the best football right now. I mean, you come back what they did after the bye and blew out Dallas and then win at Minnesota, and then they had that big win last week. And by the way, here's a situation where statistics can sometimes be misleading. They won 52 to 14 with despite gaining what 225 yards of total offense, but that's what happens when you have kick returns, etc. Takes away possessions, which is reflected in total yardage. I think that's something that you have to keep in mind. So I would say that the Super Bowl matchup that I would the Super Bowl matchup that I would think has a good opportunity if it's not Kansas City in there, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Detroit and Buffalo. All right. Well, you you look you're right. You, the thing is, they got to get out of the AFC. And there's a couple teams in the AFC that are rather dangerous. Uh, Baltimore is very dangerous. Buffalo is very dangerous. And, and both of those teams could knock them off if they made it to the championship game. I mean, I picked Kansas City to be in the Super Bowl, but 
and and the reason one of the reasons is they have a good great head coach and a great defensive coordinator and they got Patrick Mahomes a decent offensive line they're adding players they added Hopkins they're adding players in key positions they're extremely smart that's that people don't talk about how smart they are they know how to win well that's the thing if you're smart that usually means you have a really good head coach good coaching staff uh, and that's uh, what's holding back a lot of these teams. You mentioned Buffalo, Andy, and it's like, you know, you just wonder if it's Buffalo and Kansas City again, can Buffalo just figure out a way at the end of the game to beat them? Is there, I mean, or is it just going to be one of those deals where it just, I mean, I just can't imagine because Josh Allen is still very young, Tony. I can't imagine that when, when it's all said and done and these guys are retired, I, I mean, Josh Allen's going to have to beat Patrick Mahomes sometime. He, he's not, he's just too good. He's too talented. Unless, of course, the Bills wind up blowing their team up somehow and he doesn't have a good team. But as long as the Bills are a playoff Super Bowl contender, sooner or later he's going to have to get into a game situation where it's going to go his way. Yeah, but I'm out on McDermott. I'm, 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 I'm out on him. I, I, I had them last week because that was a gimme situation in Seattle. Line was great. But in a big game, I, I believe that I would I, – again, Josh Allen, he comes and goes in terms of boneheaded decisions and accuracy issues that have been the case for him since Wyoming. Uh, but McDermott, to me, I think he's lost enough big games where I've seen enough. I would much rather the Chiefs bring trust. And my answer to your question is the Baltimore Ravens uh, because, yes, at this point, you, you have to question their, their secondary and how many – you know, big plays they're allowing in key situations, um, you know, basically have led the, the, the way to their three losses uh, and almost a fourth, if you count the Dallas back. Um, but, but certainly, you know, they were in that Chiefs game, gave up big plays late. Raiders beat them in the exact same fashion that we just saw the Browns beat them. Uh, but when they're right, if they're healthy, too many playmakers with Lamar Jackson at the controls, and I mean, Justice Hill, I think, is the X factor because, you know, that kid makes so many plays and is able to give Derrick Henry a, a, a breather. Now you add Deontay Johnson to the mix. You've seen Zay Flowers take a step forward, Bateman as a route runner. I mean, this is a Baltimore offense that is going to put up points. And if their defense holds up, if they get a little more pressure, if their offensive line holds up, I think that's that's your team that will knock off uh, the Chiefs this year. That's your Cincinnati Bengals. I actually think if Baltimore plays Kansas City, I think they just, I think, I, I really believe they stand a better chance on the road. I just think at home, there'll be too much pressure and they'll be favored again. And that's just not a good spot for them. So, uh, but we'll see if they even play. Uh, because you're right, Jim. I think one of the things too that's just, they're just not the same this year defensively. And we, we talked about this a month ago. This is now what defensive coordinator number four in the last what three or four years uh, and, and this guy has been a this was a player two years ago with no resume uh you just can't you, you can't do that i mean sooner or later you know you and you just, i think you're seeing that a little bit with san francisco sooner or later you you know it, it, we start with great teams that when you're picking off the tree you know sooner or later there's nothing left uh so um but anyway all right jim did you give us a team? No, right? Who, who's going to beat the Chiefs if there's a team to beat them? Oh, I, I would, well, I, I mentioned two AFC teams that would have a chance, but I agree with Tony. Um, that you probably would eliminate Buffalo because of the head coach. And I think he has, yeah, I think Tony said it right. I'm done with, with Mc, that guy, you know, because he does blow the game. Harbaugh is a good coach. He's with Baltimore. They got Travis Henry there now. And that really, he is such a horse. If he stays healthy, it is so hard to stop him. And and mix in the backfield with, with Lamar. That's a tough one. But the best defensive coach in football the last few years, and he's proven it over and over and over again, Spagnola, it just he knows how to stop people. And he did it in the Super Bowl. And they just have that little edge to know how to win. And Mahomes, 
even though he's not what he was, but they took away a lot of his weapons. Uh, so it's just so hard to beat him. Right now, the hottest team in football, and everybody knows it's Detroit. They're a little un- unconventional with the head coach they have, but damn, they're pl- they're playing good. And what you know, you look at the yardage they had on offense last week. That wasn't their fault. <laughs> their, tr- their special teams scored all the points. They don't need to be on the field scoring points or getting yards. Their special teams, but they they've got a good offensive line. They run the ball well. Goff is very efficient. Hell, the one 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 game he was eighteen for eighteen. He's been very efficient all year. And unless they do something just like dumb, going going first down on the three yard line, their own three yard line or something that doesn't work out, you got to look at Detroit as the best team and the the one team that could beat them. That game last week looked like another league or on another planet. You had every other game like close or contested. And then you had these two teams wearing weird shades of blue. And one's killing the other, making all kinds of 80-yard runs and punt returns. And it was uh, wild to watch. I, I mean, it, from, from that standpoint, it was outside of Carolina, you had the worst team against uh, the team that's most explosive right now. Yeah, Detroit right now hasn't missed Hutchinson yet. Uh, all the talk is is that – Maybe if they get to the Super Bowl, maybe he'd be available. But then again, how impactful could he be? So it's just a shame that the injuries, this is the thing. And I'm not sure, I, I, I'm, I know it just has to be the case. Jim, you, you know, you, you can back me up on this probably better than anybody because the ten, tenure, I just don't remember growing up and having to constantly worry about injuries in I mean forget about we can even talk about I know one of the stats that was in the coffee club email this this week had to do with Tommy John surgeries in baseball but with baseball with football being a contact sport I just I don't remember growing up worrying all the time about whether or not so and so was going to be healthy and whether my team was going to be healthy because of course they're not. They're, there's always going to be an injury. It's just a matter of who well, it is. Oh, it's the Jets. Well, right, oh, right, Jermaine Johnson right. goes out. Of course he goes out. Best player on the defense. Of course he does. So that goes that grows across every every genre that we have. You know, when things were happening years ago around the world, we we didn't know it was happening until we read it in tomorrow's newspaper or the day after the newspaper. Now we get it three seconds later. We have a lot more information coming at us constantly. I've, I've had like seven or eight updates on injuries while we're just talking, coming across my phone. I haven't brought them up or interfered, but it's, it's the same thing. We're hearing about this, and the leagues have put in all these new protocols. And now we have these injury reports that are supposed to be upfront and legitimate. Now, some teams are doing it more honestly than others. Some plays game. Some play games with us, which I'd love to see stop. But it, we're, we're just knowing more now than we ever knew before. 20, 30 years ago, you didn't know who was hurt. And who's, they didn't tell you. You had no idea. Or they played through the injuries. Yes, they did. They did. Well, well that's, that's definitely more the case them. right there, Andy. Wasn't nope. that Hacksaw Reynolds who played the Super Bowl with, what, a broken leg or something? Or Something yeah, along those you lines. got another leg? Go out there. What do you, what do you need two <laughs> legs for? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think, in fairness, you could you could play through the injuries back then a little more than you can now. Now, I think if they know you're hurt, it, 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 you're, yeah. you're picked on more. And now I think there's more quality depth. Whereas back then, it's, I mean, it's, it's almost like what Dave Roberts said about Otani. And you can only say this about people like Otani. It, it, 50% of him is better than 100% of everybody else. Well, now if you're at 75%, there's probably somebody that at 90 is better. Can anybody remember a football player in the NFL tapping himself out and saying, I'm tired? And I want no. To I mean, come on, guys. How about the NBA with, 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 this, with this, this load management bullshit? What, this is bull, it's, it's, ter- it's terrible. It's gone way too far. MBA wise, I know it a little more, and that that is, it, it goes down to um, like for instance, John Miranda addressed it last night. Said, "I'll see you guys tomorrow." He doesn't like it, 
but it is an organizational thing more than more than a player thing. I think if, if you're you're eighty percent, they don't let you play. They don't let you play. So it's it's not a toughness thing. It's we have trainers monitoring you twenty four seven. And yes, if it's a big game, we'll get you ready to go. If it's game thirty five of an eighty two game regular season, you're not playing. Well, fact is though, uh, right now uh, Detroit is still winning even without Hutchinson. Uh, whether or not they get see, I remember uh, growing up watching. Uh, speaking of Hutchinson and an edge rusher, you know, watching like say Mean Joe Green and the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they won what four Super Bowls in like seven years or something, or I forget what it was. But what I recall was there was always Terry Bradshaw and there was always Mean Joe Green and there was always Lynn Swan and there was always John Stallworth and there was always Franco Harris and I can go on. And on. Those those guys weren't never hurt. How, how could how can they never got hurt? How come they were always playing? So nowadays, if they were playing, one of those guys would be out. Another guy would be, uh, you know, out for the year, and this guy would be out for six weeks. And it's just, it's just weird. It's just different. And you also never really had concussion protocols back then. Yeah, you'd sit him out a game of the series, and then he'd feel good enough and say, "I can go back in," because the players always know that they can play, and there was nothing to stop them from going back in. The player no safety has pass? a lot to do with it. No. No pop up. Not, not no. back then. So we'll see. No, I, I so we'll see if uh, Detroit can do it without Hutchinson. But this week they're taking on the Green Bay Packers, and we should we should talk about something that's coming up. Does anybody have any insight? I mean, we have a trade deadline on the fifth. That could be a. I, I know next week's a big week. The fourth, you got 113 college basketball games. Then you have the fifth, which is the trade deadline, and of course, then you have the election. This is a big week coming up. Does anybody have any idea who might be traded that that we we haven't heard about? I mean, everybody I know, you guys have contacts and and you talk to a lot of people and it, it, anything that you've hear, you're hearing. Well, what I've heard, and this is the one that's sort of a little bit against that, that there was talk that uh, Cooper Cup might be available for the Rams, but I think given their performance last week and the fact that they performed so well with him and Nakua back in there, and then, like I talked before, what they did last year. He may now be off the trading block. You know, and that's a shame, but that's exactly what happens when you're in the situation that the Rams are in, you know, financially. You know, they've kind of, uh, they, 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 they sacrificed their a couple of seasons and maybe longer to get a Super Bowl. And, I, have uh, read, I have read something about this, and I don't know that this is true, and I really don't know it's true. I have read the owner of the Rams has more money than all the rest of the 31 owners put together. Well, thank goodness there's a salary cap in the NFL. <laughs> I, I don't know how he got all that money or if that's even true, but that's remarkable. Yeah, which is another reason why, you know, you get, get wow, what a surprise. Look at that. It's the New York Yankees and the LA Dodgers in the World Series. Jets may uh, have an uh, may have a receiver that could be traded. They're they're loaded at the position right now. Just could have a lot That's of players that could be traded. Yeah. They could still trade Reddick. Uh, no, no one no one will take Reddick based oh. upon what he did in Philadelphia and what he's done with the Jets. I can't believe anyone would take a chance on him. And no one's taking Aaron Rodgers either. Yeah, and then Mike Williams. they're in a pretty unique situation too of of being a team with a lot of assets that are already out of it. Because I mean, if you if you're with, with the increased wild card, you get seven teams in. You're still not. I mean, if you're if you're a bottom feeder, you've already made trades like the Titans have. Um, you know, like the Jaguars just traded an offensive lineman to Minnesota, so that was a shrewd move. I mean, we're seeing Cleveland already. They they traded a receiver away, so move, moves are being made, you know, way before the deadline just to get ahead of these things. But you know, you, you still got 23, 25 teams alive out of the thirty. If the Jets lose tonight, their phone will be ringing tomorrow. Oh, well, the phone's already been ringing. Yeah. Uh, again, how, how do you explain Houston being the favorite? Because the Jets were the favorite when we were talking last week. By a point, whatever. The last two weeks, the Jets that? were favored. Jets were favored each of the last two weeks. Last week against New England, the week yeah. before Pittsburgh. And then Houston we became games. the favorite, though, on, I think it was uh, Sunday or Monday. 
And then 24 hours later, the Jets are favored again. Yeah. So, so it's like as soon We've as... We've talked I, about this in the past. It seems that every year there's a team that, whether it's the wise guys or some other group, constantly says this is the weekend. They back them for four or five weeks in a row. I know the Jaguars were a team one year. I think the Panthers were a team. The Browns, I gave them seven two years ago. They kept being played every week, and they continue to disappoint. And that's the Jets right now. Yeah, a lot of trades could happen. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, this is the fun thing about the way the, the, way the contracts are now in the NFL. Uh, fans like it. I know there's other sports where you don't get this type of activity. I know baseball has really suffered from that the last few years. I remember like four years ago, three, four years ago, before COVID maybe, uh, it used to be exciting with baseball and winter meetings and the deadline and not the case anymore. Um, so, you know, the NFL is a fun sport and it's even more fun now because you can make trades like like ever before. And now that they have were smart enough to move the deadline, whatever it was, two to four weeks, I think it was almost a month, right? later than it normally was. Um, that's made things even this more interesting. So we'll see. A lot of uh, activity I expect is going to happen between now and next Tuesday. And uh, as Jim said, so uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe Detroit uh, will go out and get themselves a pass rusher. But this week, they're taking on the Packers uh, with the team they have. And so far, they've been able to win without them. And as far as this series is concerned with Green Bay, uh, if you look at it, uh, the Lions have won four of the last five, straight up and against the spread. Matter of fact, I remember the last couple of years, even when Aaron Rodgers was there, uh, Detroit was given the, the uh, Packers problems when the Lions weren't that great of a team. So Detroit seems to have the Packers number lately. Uh, they've also won five straight, straight up and against the spread on the season. And uh, thanks to the playbook uh, guide, which uh, you can flash that again, Andy, if you'd like uh, for us. Uh, the Lions, there you go. The Lions have covered That's 12. That's what in the show today. The Lions have covered 12 <laughs> straight off a double-digit ATS win when they take on an NFC opponent, and they're 2-0 and in that spot this year. And by the way, Dan Campbell is like a monster in this, in this, uh, in this type of situation. He's 7-0 and all time versus 500 or better division opponents. 7-0. and oh. And he's also 10-1 and one all time off of a straight-up ATS double-digit win. 2-0 and oh in that spot this year. And I'll wrap it up with an even better one for Dan Campbell. He's 28-8-1 against the spread all time versus teams with a 500 or better winning percentage. 4-1 and one in that spot this year. And we're talking about Dan freaking Campbell. He has become uh, the most underrated coach in the sport. The, pl the players love him. They love to play for him. So he's a player's coach. What you, you know, guys... the question is, can Detroit continue the role that they're on? I mentioned what they did after the break, the three games that they've won. You know, with the exception of the 2007 Patriots who continue to, to battle teams and Lunger teams uh, by double digits, 20 points or so for you know, eight or nine weeks on that 16-0 uh, 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 regular season. This is as likely a spot as any for them to be tested. Most of my metrics have the Lions and the Packers very close to one another and certainly in the top 10 in virtually every category across the board. They're, they're certainly the ones that I consider important. Um, we saw, you know, obviously we don't know about Love, but back in week two, after Love was injured at the end of the game uh, in Brazil, uh, Malik Willis came in. They didn't ask him to do too much in the following week against Indianapolis, and that was the week I think the Packers ran like 50 times and gained like 263 yards. So I think that they're comfortable playing uh, without, uh, without Love should they need to. I, I like the spot. You know, both uh, Detroit and Green Bay, um, Green Bay, what, 6-1, and one, I think, uh, uh, Detroit's uh, no Green Bay. I think is uh, seven and one. Detroit is six and one, I believe, or maybe uh, Detroit uh, Green Bay six and two. The point is that this is a, an important game for the uh, NFC North. The division continues to excel non-division. Green Bay has a bye next week. They know the importance of this game because they still have to play at Detroit. I believe that's the Thanksgiving Day game. I'll take the three and a half with Green Bay. 
Wouldn't be shocked by the outright upset, but I also wouldn't be surprised by a three-point game. Tony? I, uh, I only know this because I, I looked at this game earlier today. It's actually the, the not the Thanksgiving Day game. It's the first weekend in December. So okay. yeah. and it might even be a Thursday night game, but it's, it's very early December. And I, I just made a mental note, wow, early November, early December. So we'll get to see where both of these teams are both of those months. Obviously, Lions, even though uh, the Packers are on a nice run as well, back-to-back uh, wins on last-second field goals. Packers just, I mean, Lions just annihilating teams, uh, averaging 43 points per game over their last four, leading the NFL, 33.4 points per game. But I am going to go ahead and take the points here with Green Bay. And only reason why is we're going to get steady rain. That's in the forecast. So I will absolutely change my mind. This will not be a big play until right around the uh, kickoff. I'll, I'll figure it out an hour before we end. A, who's starting, because I'd much prefer Jordan Love. But I'll, I'll still take the points with Malik Willis. Really nice from him to do audible, I guess, to that big play. As soon as he came into the game, shows he's growing up. Because, uh, yeah, he, he, he was like Anthony Richardson. Did not know how to play quarterback when he was uh, thrown out there by Tennessee. And he was thrown out there late in the season. Uh, but now apparently has picked up some stuff. He's auditioning for everybody uh, and also saying the right things uh, in, in locker room scrums and whatnot. So I like it with love a lot more than I like it with Willis, but I will take the points because this is Detroit's first game all season outdoors. I, I you know had a look, but obviously we have dome stadiums everywhere. They play at Ford Field. Still have not played in the elements, and boom, your first game in the elements is at Lambeau where it will be windy and rainy. So let me see how you handle that before I'm going to pick you as a uh, road favorite. Give me Green Bay plus points. Well, I could – I mean, Tony's analysis is absolutely perfect. And, and the other thing to add to that, I prefer um, Love to Willis talent-wise. However, if Love is announced as the quarterback, the line is going to come down and you're not going to get the value in the number. And adding the rain and the potential wind, first outdoor game for Detroit, all helps with Green Bay. This is a monster game. It's a monster game for both of them. So I'm not going to take anything away from anybody there. But if if Willis is announced as the starter, this line's going to go up. And you're going to get more value than you're getting presently. So if you want to bet Green Bay and you think Willis might be the player, you might want to wait. You could easily get uh, some key numbers added to to that spread. That's what I would do. And and for that sake, I would really not the target because I'd rather have the points, especially in bad conditions. Look at the line move we saw last Sunday. Look at the Arizona Miami game. I think that line Arizona Miami game. Exactly. I think that line was what two and a half, three points, almost, maybe almost before a Saturday, and then it goes five and a half. Yeah. And this is this is three, three and a half right now. So yeah, I mean, you get past the key number of four, four and a half, and, and I mean, Seinfeld reference. This rain would favor Willis. Willis's mother was a mother type of deal. Where so uh, you know he'll he'll run you first downs if Love is limited mobility wise. Maybe you do want Willis in this game, and certainly would not favor Goff who has been ridiculous in terms of accuracy of late. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's my only reason. Otherwise, I, I would not step in front of Detroit. But it just seems like a lot of factors coming uh, Green Bay's way. The, the other, other thing, thing is also... This isn't, this isn't the, I mean, it's not the only game there. You need to pass the game, and that, that's okay, too, if, if you don't get the right favorable moves. Detroit has been very successful at running the football You wonder how being outdoors, and especially in the conditions it could be in Green Bay, more likely to adversely affect the, the uh, Detroit running game than the Green Bay running game. Well, I got both teams uh, in the championship game and the season began, and I'm not changing my mind now. Uh, even if the Packers lose, I think they'll be fine. It's a long season. Uh, again, the deadline is uh, next Tuesday, and it's not like college. So, uh, And the NFC is, is, is definitely a lot easier than the AFC. So the Packers will be fine, um, e- even if they lose this game. I just think Detroit is just too hot right now. They're the exact opposite of like a team like, say, the Jets, 
you know, they, they get in any game, any situation right now, behind, it doesn't matter. They just believe they're going to win. And they have. And, uh, and, and, and so that's why I'm sticking with them. Uh, and I do think Jordan Love is going to play. Um, there's, I just can't see. I mean, he's back to practice today. And it's just, unless he has a setback, uh, you know, you're a quarterback that's making a lot of money. Uh, you're in a big game like this. He's going to play. So um, now whether or not he re-injures himself before the game or during the game, that's another story. Um, and then I would be interested to see what Willis does in a, in a big game. Like if he's forced to come in there, you know, he's not playing the Colts, he's not playing the Titans um, or the Jaguars. Uh, he's playing uh, maybe the best team in the NFL outside of Kansas City. And that would be interesting to see if uh, he can step up his game like he has in, the, in those other situations. So One other thing, and I know Detroit doesn't care about this, but Green Bay certainly does. The schedule's tough for them after next week's bye at Chicago, and then they host San Francisco. Both of those are potential losses, especially because the Chicago game is on the road. So that makes this game perhaps even a little bit more uh, important for Green Bay as far as being able to prepare for Detroit. You may be absolutely right, Greg, Greg because you know, when we're, if we're going on Green Bay, we're stepping in front of a team that's been remarkably uh, successful the last few weeks. But we've seen several other teams this year go on two, three game runs, and then all of a sudden – they lose that momentum. I'm not saying that's a reason for playing Green Bay, but I'm saying it is something that, uh, again, I'll go back to the 07 Patriots. They seem to be really the only team that's been able to go uh, on a run of 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 games in a row with winning by double digits and 20 points. Yeah, I think LaFleur has done a really good job with this team uh, because I, cause I, I, they are not playing the way the Lions are. They're not on that run they were at the end of the season last year. I think they'll get there. Uh, when that's going to be, maybe the best time to do that. Well, not maybe, but it is the end of the season. So they got a lot of time to figure out to get hot. Everything is humming, the defense, the offense, and we're just, we're confident we can beat anybody. But if you look at it, because these games that they've had, the Houston game, I mean, Houston did nothing. Green Bay's defense just shut them down, and they needed a last second field goal to win the game. Last week against Jacksonville, what on earth are they doing letting Jacksonville back in that game? So they're, they're winning because I think they're being very well coached. But that's it. They're just not firing on all cylinders right now where Detroit is. But maybe uh, Green Bay will start doing it. Like you said, it's the bye next week. So I, I just think Green Bay's time is going to come. I just don't think it's going to come on Sunday. By the way, the road team has won three straight, straight up and against the spread in the series as well. And uh, the next three games for the Detroit Lions will be against the AFC South. So uh, that's, uh, that's that weird schedule. I, 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 I think uh, the way the NFL has done it, though, is I think they've done a really good job uh, as far as the, the way that they have the schedule now in the NFL where they're like making sure all, most of all of the division games are at the end of the season. This way it should be. Yeah, I was going to say that. I was going to say that that what they did a few years ago is they made the decision that week, the final week, week 17, now week 18, all games would be division games. One of the years, I think the last two weeks were all division games. I would love to see the NFL have the final three weeks all be division games, meaning that they're all rematches of games that were played earlier on the line, which would have implications for a three-week period on division races and wildcard races. I think that would be as exciting as you could possibly make it. Uh, now, unfortunately, the one, adva- one disadvantage is that you'll be playing three division games and half the teams will be playing two of those three games on the road. All right, before we wrap up, uh, of another topic in the NFL I wanted to bring up because John Gruden... Uh, just uh, had some good news regarding his court case with the NFL. So we'll find out a little bit. Well, who knows where the court system is, how long we have to find out about that deal. But uh, it's been now a few years that John Gruden has uh, been on the outs. Uh, I think we're at that point in time right now that based on the reason he was fired, it's time. And this is my opinion. I'm a big John Gruden fan. I just love his character. I think he's great for this for the game, uh, and he's just a, he's just a lot of fun to watch. And he's a good coach. He's a Super Bowl winning coach. He knows what he's doing. I would like nothing better than to see John Gruden coaching my Jets. Uh, but uh, whether he does or not, uh, do you guys? What do you guys think about John Gruden, Jim? What do you, what do you think about Gruden? I don't know. Maybe sending him to the Jets to coach is more punishment. 
Well, again, everybody got has to get it right sometime. <laughs> Heck, they went to the AFC Championship twice with Rex Ryan for crying out loud. So you know, I I actually have forgotten all the things that got him kicked out. But I don't think you should give anybody a death sentence. Uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Whatever it was, I don't. I really don't remember. What I think it was, it was some emails that. Uh, it was email language. But, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, we don't need a death sentence. What are we? Why do we have to be so damn c- canceled culture? If somebody yeah. does something, you go take them out and shoot them. I mean, this is crazy. Everybody makes mistakes in life. We are all. Hopefully, we're all living 70, 80 years old, and and we're going to make mistakes. We all do. So give the guy a break, for Christ's sake. I I agree, and by the way, I'm going to have to leave after this uh, this discussion here because I've got somewhere an appointment at the top of the hour. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, I'm also in favor of John Gruden coming back. And yeah, I, be, growing up a Jets fan, I wouldn't uh, be averse to seeing him uh, uh, coach the Jets. Although I understand Rex Ryan is still very much interested in joining the team, and they were <laughs> mentioning him as a possible replacement for the interim coach. But uh, that aside, I think John Gruden is good for the league. He's good for the game. And I think he's also a very good coach, as he proved uh, uh, with the Raiders and with uh, Tampa Bay. And I'd like to see him coach where uh, it depends what the, the – you know where? Dallas Cowboys. Oh. I'm for anything that gets him to stop doing those creepy videos that he's been doing to pass the time. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen him, but I am they're, not. they're interesting, if nothing else. But it, it's just – I think he it, – it's a it, – there, there's a theme to it. It's about guys that are, I, I think he's alluding to himself, uh, guys that have been disrespected in terms of contract, given up on, and he drops his booms. It's a, it's a John Madden 8.0 type thing. So look it up and then cringe a little bit. But it is entertaining, if nothing else. Uh, my take on it is very simple. I would never tell anybody that you're not worth what somebody's willing to pay for, and I'm not going to tell somebody that you're not worth hiring if somebody's willing to hire john gruden I have no problem with it andy before you leave would you like to give uh, your high five report uh the high five report your 60 being... second report oh that one uh well you could use either my commentary on the indianapolis game or the uh packer game because i think okay. they be edited down i'll do that uh, i don't know that i gave i gave a selection on the packer game i will give a selection on the uh, minnesota game i do like the vikings they uh uh, they were 5-0, and and then they, uh, uh, they lost to Detroit, and they lost to the Rams uh, on a short week. Remember, they also had, I think, I think it was a short week after, uh, uh, well, they had the, the game against the Jets in London, and then they lost to Detroit, and then they had the uh, short week coming back in the game against the Rams. Um, so, uh, and also they were not, I think, prepared to face both uh, uh, Cup and uh, Nakua. May have caught them a little bit by surprise. It's a good spot for the Vikings. I mentioned that the one concern is that the Colts have played every game within six points this year. So maybe that five and a half point line is saying, you know what, maybe it should be favored, but we have to respect what the Colts have done. It's a good spot. I think the Vikings get healthy back at home. I think the running and the passing game will be uh, in sync. And I do like their defense much better than Indianapolis. So I'm looking for the Vikings to win this game, uh, let's say, 7 to 13 points. All right, Andy. Appreciate it as always. We'll talk to you next week. Good luck to all of you, uh, all of us this weekend, guys. Take care. Good luck, Andy. Good to see you. All right. Now we've got two high five reports to go. Who wants to uh, take it first? Tony, Jim? I'll defer to Jim if he wants it. If not, I'll take it. Okay, I'll take it. All right, okay, let me go ahead and get you set up here first uh, with the clock. And uh, are you I ready to go, bo- Jim? Don't, don't, I, don't I get bonus seconds because I'm older? No. <laughs> I'm, play, I'm playing the age card here. Oh, you had 45 <laughs> seconds last week. So... I know, so I, get the, I should get the 15 seconds back. Yeah, it doesn't work out that way. I don't think YouTube will let you uh, let you let you get away with that one. Well, we've already we've talked about the Detroit Packers line or the Colts and Vikings to death on this show. I mean, we really have. We've ignored a lot of other games. And is uh, that the beginning of your short, Jim? Because that's not that that's not going to work too well. Are you going to get no, you? Sorry. Yeah, because I, I I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent. Yeah, are you ready? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bet. I'm going to bet this is just off the top of my head. I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of reasons. 
Atlanta's playing inspired football right now. They're home. Dallas is coming off another embarrassment. Uh, poor coaching, bad defense, the defensive injuries. They're not running the ball well. They got one wide receiver. They got a tight end that's a little bit better than people give him credit for. Dak is overpaid at $60 million. They didn't support him. Jerry Jones is the general manager. He should not be doing what he's doing. I'm taking Atlanta. I'm laying the points. And that's just off the top of my head because we killed the other teams. We killed the other games. So I'm going to go to this game. I'm going with Atlanta. All right. Well, there you go. You got it in at 40 seconds again. 20 seconds to spare. Next week, I get it all back. Yeah, uh, you'd like that. Uh, you know, I originally thought the same thing, Jim. And then I realized, and then when I did the homework, I there was something about it that was bothering me. And then sure enough, when I did the homework, I realized what it was. And that's Atlanta as a home favorite. They just have not, not very good. No, they just have not been good in this spot. And if, you, if overall, if you just take a look at it, I think the only one they covered was the overtime win that they had to come from behind to beat Tampa Bay in that wild game. So uh, that puts them at two and two straight up, one and three against the spread as a home favorite. And how about this? This is one of the really bad ones of the week. They're one and 14 against the spread at home following a straight up ATS favored win. And they're 0 and 1 in that spot already this year. So that's not good. But well, I guess I'm fade, I'm fading a very large trend here. But that's that's why I was saying I'm feeling the same way. Kirk Cousins has had a nice season, even though he had probably his worst game two weeks ago as a home favorite against Seattle. Laid an egg. Uh but, but yeah, you I'm, do gonna, want... I'm, gonna, I'm going. I'm going with the team that's going to probably win their division, and is playing with some momentum against the team that's got to be looking at themselves in the mirror, mirror and say, "What the hell do we do next?" Do you think Dallas is one of those teams, Tony, that I mentioned, like the Jets, where it doesn't matter? They're going to find themselves in a situation at the end of the game, and their confidence is just not going to be there, and they're just not going to be able to get it done. I mean, look, we've already seen them in this situation. I mean, they, they were just in one and, and had that dramatic comeback because the 49ers forgot to cover CD land twice and uh, what they were able to do on that last uh, possession against the 49ers was feeble. So without a run game, with that defense struggling, uh, again, it, it's, it's starting to look like uh, they won't have Micah Parsons again. And if they don't have Micah Parsons, that's oh, yeah. uh, an immediate no play for me with, with Dallas. Another injury. Another star player. Uh, absolutely. Don't you think, too, and I know C.D. Lamb is a great player, and you saw it on the drive, the second-to-last drive. He's an awesome player. But I just feel that Dak just throws the ball and forces it to him too much. Uh, you know, I mean, look, at this, at this point, you, you let anybody else beat you because uh, Brandon Cooks is supposed to be that number two receiver, and he's that. So I, Tolbert, I, mean, I, I, I was think, on deserves the a shot. He's starting yeah, to finally he's not play. Bad, the, the point being is I was on the 49ers that night wondering what the hell yeah, are you doing? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and Lamb had 13 catches. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think they're, they're certainly, I, I think Jim mentioned it, they're not insulating Dak at all to be a winner this year. Uh, but they gave him the money and, and kind of put the pressure on. So I, I would definitely lean Atlanta in that game. But if Dallas does have a heartbeat, I have no faith in the uh, the Cowboys defense stopping Kirk Cousins comes off four touchdown passes against Tampa Bay. And uh, will Mike McCarthy be the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys next year? No, no. I would say no. I'm surprised he's he is right now, except that uh, Jerry Jones elaborated that he's he's no use in uh, midseason firings. I wonder if I wonder if Johnson will. I wonder if the Cowboys is, 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 is a job that he would take. Jimmy? Oh, ben Johnson. Oh, well, well. I wonder if that would be the job because they know he's been picky. Would he would he go there with Jerry? Is that one of those spots where he, no, no, not for me. I'm going to still be patient. Well, money. Yeah, talks. that's a, the that's a situation talks. I'd be patient with. Money talks. I mean, he offers somebody enough money. Uh, you know, they're going to show that's up. I mean, it, there's always a price. 
But the problem is you're not going to go there and be the coach as long as Jerry's acting as the coach. That's the problem. And, 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 and this is also something that we talked about last year. We'll talk again as the season progresses, is how important this season may be for Detroit. Because sooner or later, Ben Johnson's gone. And what will happen to your offense when he leaves? So, you know, take advantage of that as, soon, as, as, as much as you can as you got him. Um, you got to remember something, though. They, they, don't, they could pay Ben Johnson a lot of money to stay in Detroit. And, and we go back to the beyond the player. Go to the player the person, the human being. He's got a wife. I'm sure he's, he might have kids. Sure. They might not want to move. They might have a mother and father who live there, or a whole family who lives there. I don't know any of sure. them. I'm just guessing and surmi- surmising here. Sometimes the mo- wife says, I don't want you to take that job. We'll take uh, 30 million here instead of going 40 million there. I mean, if that, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the people make choices other than for money. Yep. And it means Spagnola was, you know, he, he, he moved to be a head coach. He's a better defensive coordinator. I'm sure they're paying him astronomical money not to go anywhere again, because he would be a guy that would, a lot of people would want. He's only you would the best think. defensive coordinator. He's the best defensive coordinator in the business. Yeah. So. Well, that's the one thing to keep in mind, too, is is it's a lot more difficult for these defensive guys to get jobs nowadays. Uh, they get hired, but it's it's harder. Uh, they Everybody wants the offensive guy. And, 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 and he's talking about, uh, you know, the Jets with the, their next head coach, and you mentioned um, Rex Ryan. I know he's on the list, but there's also Vrabel. And to me, it's like the Jets have got to stop hiring defensive coaches because the problem is when you hire a defensive coach, you're hiring that guy because what? He's smart. You think he's a good head coach. And that's what makes him hopefully also a good head coach. The problem oh. is that guy still has to go out and find a competent offensive coordinator to run your offense. And if you don't hire the right guy, it doesn't matter who your coach is. You're not going to succeed. And that's been the problem with the Jets for far too long. They're going to need a quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is Oh, yeah, they need a quarterback, but they also need an offensive coach. And that's going to be hard. That's going to be hard. They already blew a draft choice a couple years ago with Wilson. Now they got him with all that money and there's contract money involved. You, They're not running this. This team is five years away from being a winner. Well. They got a lot of talent on that team, though. So, it's it's not talent's not the issue. We can't hear you. They got a lot of talent on that team. Well, it's not the issue is not talent. Tony's talking. You can't hear him. Oh no, I was I was actually referring to somebody else. So I, oh, I oh, okay. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, All right. I, heard I, saw, you I saw you talking and I couldn't hear you. Tony, <laughs> you're up. You ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Pitt and SMU. So let me plug that there are, there are going to be two articles about that you should read. One not written by me was uh, on what Pat Narduzzi did in the NIL uh, climate that I thought was interesting. And one that is written by me that is the longer version of this preview. Bottom line, Pitt comes in 7-0, 6-1 against the number. Uh, and SMU 7-1, 5-3 against the number. I think this is going to be a tight game. There's uh, health concerns regarding both quarterbacks. But both should play. Eli Holstein, the Alabama transfer, really has been dynamic for Pitt. Didn't have to do much against Syracuse and actually got banged up late. So his numbers were down. He only threw for 108 yards. But I think he should be fine here. And Kevin Jennings is going to play for SMU. Tight game. If you can get seven and a half, I do so with Pitt uh, right now. Plus seven is a little leery. But I definitely think the Panthers have a shot to win outright. So give me Pittsburgh. Uh, to remain undefeated by beating SMU at uh, in Dallas. Yeah, that was some crazy game last week. I mean, they turned the, the ball game? over six times. Or the Cuse game. Yeah, the SMU game against Duke. The Duke game. Six times, and they still win the football yep. game. So Yeah, I've, I've never seen that before. It was, and they said it hadn't happened in, I forget what number of years, but it was – a six zero turnover margin and you don't get any points and then yeah. you lose in overtime. Crazy. I, wow. I hate to interrupt, but I'm gonna have to run. It's yeah, we're 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 done. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I, I gotta run too, but 
Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Talk Good to everybody show. next week. We miss Mark. I hope yes. Mark's okay. Nothing wrong, I hope. But uh, we'll see you next week. Sounds good. All right. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Good luck, guys.